it's great for you guys to also meet our team and uh, what God's doing in our midst. So uh, we're really glad to be together. Hey, Mark, nice to see you and to begin to get to know you. Same. Uh, meet you guys. Thanks, Bart. Bart and I had a great uh, chat the other day, and he was filling me in on what's happening in the church and the exciting things that are not just developing now, but that have been processed for years now. And uh, you're at a threshold of some pretty exciting transformational uh, work that Jesus is doing in the congregation and your community. So Deb and I are super excited about that. One of the things that uh, Bart pointed out is that you have a real clear plan for congregational discipleship and then what I would call kind of sub-congregational, the Sunday school setting. But uh, he, he said he wanted a little help with the, the smaller, uh, you know, one-on-one, one-on-two, -on -one, one one-on-three type of discipleship. So, uh, you know, I, he came to me and so I put it in the hands of more capable people, Deb and Mark. Mark. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that's what we're going to kind of lay a foundation for today. And did I express that accurately, Bart, so we're not chasing our tail? Okay. All right. So one of the things is we're going to start out with the simple to complex. We're going to go from micro to macro in, in the idea of how do we disciple smaller groups and individuals. And uh, so we want to go from, from science to art. And so Deb is going to take the micro, the, the super simple, and we'll discuss that a little bit. And then I asked Mark to talk about the big picture, the macro, and, and having a plan for the long haul with uh, helping uh, lost people become leaders in the church. So um, Mark calls it lost to leader, L to L. So let's start with Deb. I'm gonna share my screen. And Deb's gonna, she's gonna lay out the simple plan, so. Okay, so this is like ABC, okay? We're like going back to the basic basics. Um, apparently, um, if you can ask these three questions, you, you can become an expert disciple, disciple maker. <laughs> and um, so this would be in a setting where you're kind of, you know, one-on-one -on -one or maybe a group of, of three, four to the say maximum. Um, so the questions are, how are you doing? You know, we just want to kind of catch up and see how things are going in their life. Um, second question, what are you getting out of the word? And of course, we're making some assumptions here <laughs> that they are in the word, which hopefully they are. Um, and also that they are um, used to hearing from Jesus and from the Holy Spirit through the Word. Um, so what are you getting out of the Word? And, you know, that, that should lead to some pretty rich discussion, hopefully, which would probably entail some acts of obedience, things that they're, they're um, hearing um, the Holy Spirit, you know, through the Word that they need to change in their lives or that they need to do more of or less of or whatever. And then the final question is, how are your people doing? Okay, we're making an assumption here too, that they are discipling someone else or that they are pre-discipling someone else. So this would be the time that they can share about someone they're discipling or um, somebody that they're uh, sharing the gospel with. Um, yeah, so 
that's basically a very simple way, you know, simple biblical reproducing way of kind of a first step in disciple making, if you ask these three questions. Okay, so the question for discussion, Deb made a comment. If you learn these three questions and you begin to ask them of people, and like Deb was saying, it, predis it presupposes that you've trained them in something, or you are training them, uh, she said that you will become an expert disciple maker. Exaggeration, uh, and now I personally have said that many, many times. Why or what is the genius in these three simple questions? Well, I think I think if you're if you're asking, you know, how does this help? First off, it it assumes that you have a genuine interest in others, which is core to disciple making. If you're not genuinely interested in them, their walk with the Lord and their fruitfulness, um, then we've got to go back another step and say we need to work on that person. Saying you, if you want to disciple you you should have some form of compassion for these folks, how they're doing spiritually, uh, how they are in the word and their walk with Jesus and how they are with others both. And I, and I was assuming too, Deb, when you were saying, how are your people doing? Um, we're also talking about their marriage, their family and their relationships because of the health that those things must have to be effective in disciple making. So for me, that's the genius that's behind this is, that it's, it's, it's a compassionate way of beginning reaching others. Yes, one of the greatest pitfalls in discipleship programs is that there are programs and people start be feeling like projects. Mm -hmm. And so you hit the nail on the head, Bart, if love doesn't come first, we're sunk, okay? What else? What else do you observe about these three questions? I think it it helps you to add to what Bart said. I think it helps you build a relationship with, with the people that you're discipling. And the other thing it does, uh, you know, it will help you kind of hone in on maybe where you need to focus. Let's say you only have an hour, 45 minutes to an hour. It really helps you to focus on maybe a need or an area where, where they're struggling. Because I often act, like to ask at the end of the conversation when I'm working with, I'm working with somebody now. I always like to ask, you know, what do you need me to pray for, mm -hmm. uh, for you? And it's kind of an interesting question because um, sometimes they'll, they'll kind of ponder it and they'll think deeply about it. And then typically, you know, they give me an idea of, of their need, right? So I really think relationship, get to the point of, you know, because you may have a limited amount of time and maybe be impactful enough before you meet again. Hmm. Good. Excellent. How about you, Amber? What are your thoughts or Richard? Um, I like what Deb said about... Um what are you getting out of the word as far as acts of obedience, like time in the word um, should not just be at a surface level, but there's always a call to, to obedience in some form or fashion. Excellent. Yeah. One of the things that uh, I like about this is is super simple and simple reproduces. Complex needs uh, massaging and mm -hmm. mentoring and time and mistakes, but you almost can't mess this up, okay? It's just three questions, and 
we just help people ask three questions and this is a great place to begin if you whoop a complex discipleship process on people it's kind of like putting a speed bump in the path before you even get started so my recommendation is that you start with these three questions and as people number one have people to mentor <laughs> That's, that's a big problem. You can have three questions and nobody asks them. You know, that's, that's the issue, right? So uh, you start with the three questions and ha have somebody asking these three questions and you build on that and ultimately you're going to get pretty far down the road. Bart, when you and I started, it was... How's your marriage? You know, hey, let's go fishing. You know, it it was, and let's share the gospel with these students. It was super simple. You know, it was not complex at all. Then we started the two seven series. Well, that got a little bit more complex. It lasted two years. You know, so we start simple. The other thing is, if you notice the last question it gets beyond biblical counseling discipleship and so much of discipleship in our culture is all about me i i gotta get my needs fixed i gotta manage my sin you know and it doesn't take the next step to hey, I'm investing in you, who are you investing in? And Deb and I call this grandparenting question. You can ask a lot of parenting questions, that's great, but let's start asking grandparenting questions as well. How are the people that you're praying for, that you're sharing the gospel with, doing? That's a fundamental start out of the gate question. If you don't have anybody that you're meeting with weekly, at least you should be praying for some lost people, you know, and we can start there. Like Bart said, are you praying for your wife and kids or your husband, you know? Let's start there and start getting beyond ourselves into loving and serving others. So I'm preaching right now. So. <laughs> well, Chuck, you know, just from testimony, mm. I think part of the ability that that came to me quickly in that first year uh, under your leadership was the call to not be self-centered, mm. and that was demonstrated by you and Debbie in lots of ways. Even when you guys took us in your home and let us stay there for a season while we were in transition to seminary. Uh, but also the very first person I ever led to the Lord, uh, his name was Tim, who worked at the plant that I was working at, came from uh, this incredible burden that I had for the people I worked around at the plant, so much so that they came to me and they said, you must be a Jehovah's Witness. Because Baptists are not this interested in telling other people this message. And so uh, I, it actually got around the whole plant that I was Jehovah's Witness because the only person any of them had ever known to be that interested was the Jehovah's Witness who came knocking the doors in Veronica, Georgia. And so I remember that non-self-centeredness was not just taught to me, but it was modeled to me by you guys. Um, and to share it. And that became a part of who we are today. Yeah. Yeah. And I think too, you know, Chuck and I were talking about, you know, there were so many years where we did kind of one-on-one -on -one discipleship and we're like, man, if we had incorporated sharing the gospel on the spot, you know, when it, like if you're meeting in a public place, say for example, and I would encourage you to do this when you meet with people, don't meet in a, in a place where nobody can see who you are. Or where you are like meet in a mcdonald's meet in a coffee shop meet in a place where and people are going to hear what you're talking about and there will be opportunities to share the gospel i guarantee if you're looking for them 
they will be there. And um, what a great way to model, you know, sharing the gospel yeah. out in the wild, you know, so to speak. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, there may be times where like if you got moms with young kids, they got to be at home. That's, you know, like, of course, it's appropriate to be meeting in a house or something. But really, meeting in public is a great way to get beyond ourselves, too. Yeah. Okay, so we started with the super simple, and I highly recommend that. But uh, one of the things Mark is going to do for you is cast vision for personal, small group discipleship. And this can even have an impact on congregational discipleship. We started with Jesus's simple, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Uh, Mark is going to get into uh, Jesus's whole process of helping them become these fishers of men. So Mark, uh, go ahead and explain what you mean by leader to law or loss to leader. Let's not turn that around. <laughs> that, okay, that was great. Um, Chuck, I'll just ask you this question. Do you think it's helpful to share with the tools on it or is it just to uh, talk through it with principles only? No, share, share it with share the it. tools on it, but okay just we're aware that you don't know all of these tools and you don't need to use all of these tools. You probably have your own tools, but Mark will hit the principles as he goes through. That's great. Well, um, just as a bit of a context for um, how I, I've really been formed and I would encourage you guys to be formed in what does that look like to get the 10,000 foot view I remember in the 90s, I'm old enough to remember when we were using the WWJD phrase. Did you guys use that back in the day, right? What would Jesus do? And I think when I heard that at first, it was primarily focused on the morality of Jesus or how would Jesus respond in specific situations? What, what would be the right thing to do here? But mostly we didn't look to Jesus's model for discipleship, for strategy, for church planting. And so when I began to meet Chuck and others like him um, who were using Jesus, not only with the WWJD for morality, but also for a model of discipleship, that just began to reshape everything for me. So even as I'm going to share this with you, enough preamble, but even as I'm going to share this with you of loss to leader, I think at the end of the day, the thing that I hope you take away is, um, I was sharing this at the beginning, introducing myself as the Great Commission is what all those questions that Chuck and Deb are highlighting should point towards all of us uh, as we're making disciples should point towards um, our simple tools should all point towards getting back to the model of Jesus. So this lost the leader path that we use in our disciples is an attempt to identify how do we see Jesus taking his disciples from lost to leader and how can we begin to um, yes, use some simple tools, but really as much as possible to um, form disciples who make disciples following the way of Jesus. So this, uh, sc this screen share I'm about to share with you is special to me. I had a disciple who wrote this down, and so it's fun to even be able to model and talk you through this, but I didn't even come up with this. This was a disciple I've trained who's working with disciples. So uh, I'll just share that as, as a front piece. But uh, So this is called our Lost to Leader Path. And uh, we're using this in uh, our network here in Oklahoma City it, among the, the collegiate uh, space, college students. And I'll just talk you through this. Um, so you see on here, there's, there's lines and arrows, and that's where it's leading us down a path. So up here in the top left-hand corner is our lost, and then we're going to follow this down all the way to this side with leaders. Now, don't worry about, uh, again, like Chuck is saying, about understanding all the tools, but I'm just going to talk through the reasons why um, we have attempted to implement what we see in the life of Jesus for taking people from loss to leader. So up here at the top left-hand corner, and if you're familiar with a tool called Three Circles, uh, essentially starting with this place of how do we share the gospel with somebody, both God's story and our story. 
And how do we begin to train our disciples to be familiar with God's big story in a clear, simple way that um, is careful to articulate what the gospel is um, and do it in a way that uh, is, is short enough that somebody can hear it from our mouth to their ear or and, and or sharing our personal story. So we start with the gospel up here, that lost person hearing the gospel. And then from there, um, we need to identify who is it that's hearing this. And so in Acts 17, for example, Paul is sharing the gospel. And as he's sharing, different people respond in different ways. And anytime we share the gospel, we can't determine how somebody's going to respond, but we need to be ready to know and, and trained to know how do we respond if somebody is a, is a red light. So this is a traffic light. They're a red light uh, and they have no interest. You see, there's not, a, there's not a next path for them. We bless them. We say, okay, we bless you. Uh, we might also might have somebody who's, who's saying, I'm uh, a yellow light. They're interested in hearing more. That's what Paul experienced uh, there in Acts 17. And so uh, they were interested in hearing more. And they had some that were green lights that were ready to respond, to be baptized, and to begin to become followers of Jesus. And so in this uh, lost to leader path after the gospel shared, and somebody says, I'm interested in hearing more, but I'm not ready to follow Jesus yet. Uh, we take people into some simple stories from the Bible that really we call them stories of hope, uh, seven specific stories of hope. But each of these stories are pointing towards, for example, uh, Luke 7 with this, uh, this story of the repentant woman, this woman who comes in and uh, she's a woman of the night and she, is, uh, she comes to the feet of Jesus. She's crying tears and, and everybody's judging her, but she loves much and turns to follow Jesus. And there's this example in the story of this woman who walks in great repentance. So each of these stories, the outcome, and again, Deb was highlighting this idea of obedience-based discipleship. That's what, that's what Jesus points to in the Great Commission. So we're pointing to, if they're not ready to say green light, yes, let's go yet, we want to point again and again and again towards stories of hope, yes, but stories that uh, the outcome of that is repentance to turn towards following Jesus. So yellow light, that's a, that's a simple next step is taking them through these stories, each of which is pointing towards repent and believe. That's what we're called to do. And hopefully that their, their response is, yes, I want to turn to follow Jesus and be baptized. And um, honestly, there should be a, a baptism symbol right here as well. But whether they're green light or yellow light, they're going to be baptized and they're going to come to follow Jesus. And now they're beginning to join in with uh, the rest of the community and learning how to follow. We use a, uh, a, a, an initial way or simple tool of training new believers uh, it's called 411, but the goal of it really is to equip that new believer. We believe that you see this, for example, in John chapter 4 with the woman at the well, or Mark chapter 5, the demoniac. Here are people immediately released to go back to their own people and share their story. So the woman at the well, come meet the man who told me all I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Um, the demoniac, he goes back to his friends, his family to uh, share what God has done for him. So we want to immediately equip a new believer in what their identity in Christ is, who their mission field is and their friends, their family, those that are around them, and then how to share their story with that group of people. And so this tool 411 is, an, is a way to train them. And that really should be for everybody. So right here, we're, we're identifying this with a, with a green light. Somebody's immediately ready to follow or a yellow light, and then they're coming in, but really even long time believers, we want to equip them as well to, to take action on their faith, to know their identity, to know who their mission field is, their friends, their family, their neighbors, their coworkers, and then how to share their story with them. So that's what this simple tool does. Um, and then we're going to begin to bring them into this process of how to learn how to become followers of Jesus that can do what that great commission identifies, and that's to put into practice all that he's commanded us. So we have a, a simple process called three thirds, but the goal of this process is a few simple things to cast vision, to uh, bring a, a simple way of being accountable for what we're learning, learning new uh, simple stories that have obedience as a, a next step towards uh, the commands of what we find in the life of Jesus, and then being accountable to set goals for how are we going to put that into practice this week. So 
Um, all that to wait to say just in summary, as somebody is a, as a green light, yes, or a yellow light, maybe, but then they ultimately say we want to follow Jesus, they're entering into the life of the church where they're learning their identity, who they're going to share with, how they're going to share, and then getting in this regular rhythm that we call three-thirds or a week, simple weekly meeting format uh, to learn how to be accountable, to set goals, and to grow um, to do all that Jesus has commanded us. So. Uh, so that's bringing people into the life of the church. And then there's going to be a few. And so that's where we call this the lost two leader form or a uh, pathway. So there's going to be a few that are going to be leaders. Some may stay here for a long time, um, but we're going to hope that we're going to find a few that will be maybe for the acronym FAT, F-A-T, Faithful, Available, Teachable. Um, what my disciple at here added sharing. Uh, Chuck sometimes uses the, the letter reproducible. So F-A-T and he has an R at the end. But however, whichever one you want to do, we're looking for those that are going to be um, ready to put into practice um, what they're learning and share it with others. And then we're going to pour deeply into them. And so as we find those few leaders that are faithful, available, sharing, teachable, if it's yes, they'll go here. If no, they're going to continue to be in this uh, regular rhythm of life of the church until we see that fruit in their life. And as we see that forming in them, um, we're going to begin to bring them into this uh, pattern of leadership development. And I honestly, I use the questions Chuck's talking about uh, most of the time. There's some other tools here, and I could unpack all of that uh, if there's time or interest. But um, the idea being three main things, and this is things that Chuck has highlighted to me and I found to be really important with leaders. I want to point back to Jesus as the model. And as the one that they're connected to, I want to connect them to word and spirit where they're hearing, knowing God's word, regularly digesting it. They know how to, uh, to interact with God's word for themselves and spirit. They know how to see what God's doing and respond to him. And then they've got a vision for generations of discipleship. So that Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Uh, so this is now taking what's already been vision cast here, because that was in, that was here early on, but now we're really pointing to those few to say, where are the, the new people and the new places that need to hear about this gospel that haven't yet? And then now they're going to not, this arrow doesn't mean go back into the same, uh, church, but they're going to start these groups of their own. Uh, they're going to go share the gospel with new people and new places and see all of this happen in a, in a place that hasn't yet heard. So lots of different pieces there we could unpack, but um, that's the loss to leader path. Yeah. And so basically when we look at Jesus, he says, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And then he begins the model. What does it look like to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom? What does it look like to assess responses? What does it look like with beginning or short-term discipleship? What does it look like for long-term discipleship and community in church? And then what does it look like to develop leaders to repeat this entire process? And that's what Jesus did with his disciples. Now, it is. It, at first glance, it seems very complicated. But again, you start simple and then add the bricks as you build the house. So uh, we gave you the micro and we gave you the macro. So now it's time for you to uh, ask questions or uh, tell us to get out of yeah. town. <laughs> tell us to take a hike. Hey, Mark, can you throw your screen back up like you had it? Okay. Um, I'll talk to you about some of the things we've started doing. Uh, we've started presenting some of these tools. Now, the, um, as the more I'm watching and following you guys' channel and the channels y'all are connected to, I'm finding these tools. Um, so, for example, last Wednesday night, uh, we used the tool, the 411 tool that's on video that's linked, um, where he just first introduces the 411. Over the next several weeks on Wednesday nights, I'm going to be breaking down each section of the 411. 
and camping on those sections so that we go in deeper on each part of that. Um, I wanted to ask just a couple of questions on this and Mark, you may have talked about it. Do y'all have a link to the stories of hope already set up and prepared for teaching? Yeah. Okay. Um, if, if you guys could share that with us a little bit later and is the stories of hope, uh, also, uh, similar, there it is. Great. Uh, is it also similar or is there a similar approach when you're using the study called the commands of Christ? In other okay. words, is that an alternative to stories of hope that you want to take somebody through as an evangelistic method as well? Mark, go ahead and answer that question. Man, uh, that's a great question, Bart. It sounds uh, that just by you asking that tells me you're processing a lot and you're getting some of the nuance of this. So uh, the, the difference that I have experienced as we've done this is the difference between somebody who's a yellow light and somebody who's a green light. And so the idea behind that yellow light is somebody who's, they're interested in learning more. They are, they have questions. Um, but they're not yet fully ready to shape their life around the ways of Jesus. And so the, the yellow light, uh, the stories of hope are all pointing towards, and again, I'll share that screen. These are, these are stories that are pointing towards repentance. So the sinful woman, the tax collector, Zacchaeus, the thief on the cross, the prodigal son, each one of these stories, uh, the next step for each of these characters is is turn turn and follow jesus okay. and even the thief on the cross that's cutting it right down to the wire <laughs> but yeah. they're turning to follow jesus at the very last minute um and so the the the, the stories of hope the uh, they're pointing towards a uh, a response of repent and believe the commands of christ on the other hand i'm going to share the, the first screen again the the lost to leader path um I didn't go into this too much in depth. I'm trying to, I was trying to stay kind of more uh, the big picture view. But uh, as we're training people in church, part of that short-term discipleship that I didn't quite articulate well, Chuck brought that back in, but is that we want to we want to train people into practicing church. And so those commands of Christ that we're using are each um, their commands of Jesus, but brought together we're teaching somebody how to practice and live out the life of the church together. That is so and, helpful. And so those commands of Christ, uh, there's different story sets you'll find out there, but most often they're all drawn from Acts 2, 36 to 47, where the church is formed. Holy Spirit falls, the church is formed. What do they do? Well, how do they begin to practice life together? Well, they're living out the commands of Christ that Jesus modeled and did with his disciples. And so um, that's how I would differentiate them. Yellow light, uh, you're going to want to do those stories of hope. And then the commands of Christ, you're helping short-term discipleship to help that disciple not only learn how to follow Jesus, but they don't even realize it. They're learning how to follow him as a church together. Good. Second question, M-A-W-L, off to the right. Uh, tell me what that is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're, I, well, I'll, get, I'll let you take a voice break for a second, Mark. <laughs> so M-A-W-L is just um, part of the discipleship process where M stands for model. So this is where I'm going to show them how to do something, whether it's sharing the gospel or reading the Bible or praying or whatever the skill is. Um, once you've modeled, then you move on to A, which is assist. I'm going to assist them in doing this. Like I'm going to be right there with them. And then once you're, um, once they seem proficient, you want to move to W, which is watch. Now I'm just going to observe them doing it and swoop in only if they need help, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, and then when they become proficient, we've got L, which is we're going to kind of launch the skill in with them. Like they are fully capable of doing whatever the skill is. So. Okay. So you know, not like a bear mauling you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This I, is an I figured that there were some, uh, some of the things that we had talked about before on that. And so I remember, Chuck, that that's actually something you shared with our staff a few yeah. years ago. So that's 
that's extremely helpful. Okay, one more set of questions. Hey, before we we'll move that. on, Amber, yeah. you were going to say something. Oh, I was just going to say a couple years ago in Jordan, um, I, the group that I was um, working with was working through these very things, and so the MAWL that I do, we do, and then you do, as I observe. Anyway, it's just cool to see that. Yeah. Yeah. I guess in uh, real life. So anyway, my two yeah. cents. <laughs> Good. Yeah, it's always helpful when you when you are familiar with the terms, you know, because then it's like, oh, okay, it makes it easier to kind of connect the dots. So yeah. Um, one of the things about the stories of hope, um, uh, you know, even though there's seven stories, if they say yes after story number one, you can immediately go to the commands. You don't have to go through your list, you know what I mean? It's kind of like the stories of hope is just to get them to the point where they know who Jesus is enough to make a decision to follow him. And if it's on story one, if it's on story five, it's on story seven, you know, whenever they're ready to say yes, then we're like, okay, the next step, baptism, and then we're gonna immediately start with the commands. And, but we've actually known people that don't do the stories of hope at all. They just start with the commands. So it's like, you know, it's super flexible, whatever works, you know, whatever you all decide to do, what, you know, it's like, it's not, it's not regimented in other words, you know. Yeah. I'll share just a, a, a 15 second story and then back to you, Bart. But uh, Marcus, who created this map, he was doing the stories of hope with um, a guy who's, he's a, Paul director on a university campus and one of his resident assistants he was doing this with and he got to story two and the guy said well when are we going to get to baptism when are we gonna I want to talk about that and Marcus was like right now we're talking about that right now <laughs> so they immediately jumped to talking about that and the guy got baptized so to Deb's point it's uh the point is to get to where they understand enough of what does this mean to count the cost and follow and it's awesome if that happens fast yeah. that's beautiful yeah. Okay. Um, running on to the next side on the left, um, you have the letter Y. Is that a Y in uh, in parentheses? Yeah. Okay. Tell me about that real quick. Yeah. Sorry. I, I drew this in like uh, five minutes with Marcus and I'm using it way more than I planned to. So, but th this is, uh, it's the idea of, it, are they going to be yes? faithful available sharing teachable or no not and then okay. back into the life of the church and yeah. actually this is a great discipleship leadership point if you cannot draw your plan on a napkin <laughs> it's way too complicated well i'm Go loving ahead. this i'm <laughs> loving this yeah, yeah I'm, I'm so fired up. That's why I'm so full of questions. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, you know, one of the things that's helpful is to have a clear path. Yeah. The clearer the path is, the easier it is for everybody to understand how to, how to go from, you know, somebody who you just shared the gospel with who said yes to the point where they're ready to, you know, lead, like, you know, Mark is talking about. And it's like, if you, if, if you can explain it and teenagers understand it, you are like on, on market, you know? <laughs> yeah. Could I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, if you fall in the no category and you circle back in, back, back around to the life of the church, what, what is that looking like for them? Are they just, you know what I mean? I understand yeah. we're trying to get them to become a discipler. Are they just staying in a group somewhere? and continuing with growth, hoping that they'll move to the yes later? Or are they, where, where are we at with that? Yeah, what my expectation, and I think Jesus's expectation as well, is that you become the leader that he meant you to be. And so we don't want to force the process down somebody's throat. But we also don't want to uh, let them sit sour and soak uh, mm -hmm. and not be transformed. So we're going to do the appropriate spurring on within the church in order to press people towards uh, transformation, not towards uh, not 
uh, force them, but press them, if you know what I mean. And uh, uh, some people, you know, they're going to be leaders in their family. They're going to be leaders in sharing the gospel. Leading a small group might be beyond their skill set. Leading a church might, ve might very well be beyond most people's skill set. So as disciple makers, this is the art part, is to determine what is Jesus doing in this person's life and help them become all that Jesus wants them to be. So, Richard, did that answer the question? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, good. It, it sounds very diplomatic to me, and sometimes I can talk in circles, so. Yeah, and we have to be really careful. You know, like, we don't, we're not saying, if you, if you don't go plant a church, or if you're not a missionary, you're a loser. I mean, that's not at all what we're saying. You know, it's like, uh, we just, I think, you know, like I've known someone, it took them probably five years of maybe you would call it simmering, where they're just in an environment where they're in the word and they're hearing from God and they're trying to put it into practice. You know, it just, sometimes it just takes a while for transformation to happen. And that's okay. You know, um, we're not, but then sometimes it just, people are like, boom, I'm ready, let's do this. You know, now maybe at some point we're gonna to get to character and everything, which that's part of discipleship as well. But, you know, we've, what we've experienced is, you know, you disciple many people and every now and then you'll see someone who's just like, you know, obviously for soil from the beginning, you know. And so, and, but instead of, you know, kind of not paying attention to them, we're gonna be like, hey, there's a next step for you too. You know, you don't have to sit here and simmer like, you know, some of the folks are doing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Thank you. I think one other thought there, uh, I've found that the no people um, are most often those that have, they, they've gotten kind of used to what business as usual or church as usual looks like, which is uh, knowledge. We tend to give people a lot of new lessons, new knowledge. And this three thirds process, I don't know if you guys have visited that or looked at that, but um, it, it does build into a lot of high relationship where you're connecting with people, but also that high challenge where somebody is going to come out with uh, setting a goal. What are you going to do this week based on what we learned? And then next week, ask them, how did that go? And just the very nature of that process is going to be a, a big um shift for a lot of believers, a long time believers. And so at first the no may mean they're just coming to just learn something new and they're not doing anything with what they're learning. Um, and they're going to realize they're going to be asked week after week, what are you doing with what you're learning? How's that going sharing with others? And uh, right now they're like, oh, I didn't know we we're going to do that. And that's a no. But this three thirds process, really, it's training them to say, yeah, we're going to be practitioners of our faith. So that to me is the biggest difference between the yes and the no is those that are coming like we see in most church environments just to get more knowledge versus those that want to put this into practice in their life. That And so like they, Chuck and Deb are saying, yes doesn't mean you have to necessarily move to another country and plant churches, but it does mean you're putting into practice what you're learning. Mark, uh, one more one more set of questions on the left side. Uh, this I'm uh, supposing is the four fields with the heart around it. That's the four fields. Okay, great. And then the one three nine is the multiplication um, with Paul and Timothy, and then faithful men. And the eighteens are the development of those sub teams that you're discipling out of that one three nine. Uh, yeah. So. A, a, a teams in one three nine really is uh, the same thing in the way that we do it. Um, a teams is really just um, it's a way of kind of uh, putting some structure to the one three nine really is the concept that you're highlighting, and then a team is a a structure for it to happen in. Yeah, A stands for accountability, by the way. Right. Yeah, <laughs> which now with the A team. Um, you know how we had the, the simple three questions that we started with? Mm -hmm. Okay, so now I've got an A-team format, which you, it can look like anything. It's, you know, but 
you know, like in this format, they're asking 10 questions. Um, they're praying to become more like Jesus. How are you doing? Did you obey what God told you last time? What are you hearing from God in his word? Do you have any sin to confess? Have you experienced inspiring and challenging fellowship? Is there any encouragement or correction you'd like to speak into my life? How is it going sharing the gospel? Spend time in prayer. What do you sense God wants you to do? Set goals for the next meeting. Practice your testimony and share immediately if, if possible. You know, it's, so it's like we went from a simple three questions to a smorgasbord of <laughs> an hour meeting, you know, and that's definitely, definitely more kind of long term ish, you know, discipleship, you know. Can you provide those for us too, Debbie? Um, sure. Yeah. Okay. And then one more question on this chart the one or the IOI 101. What is that part, Mark, or Debbie, or Chuck, or anybody? Mark, go ahead. All right. Uh, so, um, again, this is like a 30,000-foot view, so th there's a lot that's happening between here and IOI. But um, when it, the iron on iron um, is a, uh, it's a problem-solving format uh, of, for, for developing leaders. So, um, I'll put it this way to you, Bart. Um, to get to this point where you're developing a leader is a lot of high directive, simple tools. And you see this in the life of Jesus. My favorite examples in Luke 10, where Jesus sends out his disciples and they're uh, going before him to share the gospel. And then in Luke 11, they come back, teach us how to pray. So they don't yet even know the why behind what they're doing, but they're just putting stuff into practice. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. iron on iron comes along to answer your question, having put into practice these simple tools in the harvest field that we're in, if we're doing that enough, we're going to begin to hit some barriers to multiplication. We're going to begin to hit some challenges. And what we learned is we're going to hit a brick wall and we're going to need to develop a, another set of skills where we're learning how to um, problem solve and uh, get past some of those barriers. So the core uh, function of the iron on iron, I mean, it's an encouraging, it's a place of encouragement for leaders um, to, to get kind of that 30,000 foot view of what's happening in their work. But really at the end of the day, the main thing I've seen is it develops the muscle of problem solving for leaders to be able to transfer their skills to going to new people and new places and continue the work. Yeah, and the reason why this is so important for leadership collaborative assessment, iron on iron, is because uh, the Marine Corps has a saying, the first thing to die on the battlefield is your plan. <laughs> okay, so this looks great, but once you start discipling people, I mean, uh, it, it goes crazy. And so this is the opportunity to refocus, address some issues. Hey, Chuck, you didn't tell me this guy was going to jump off a building and act like Superman. You know, uh, you know, there's things that happen in the disciple making process that we need to come together and address. And some of the people that are a little longer in tooth and have experience more often can help them, but really it's about going back to Jesus, back to the Word of God, and solving problems based on Scripture and the example of Jesus. So IOI is kind of the quality control piece in all of this. It really helps us to stay on track, but also be flexible enough to meet the needs, the real needs that are happening downstream. So, and there's there's actually a format for that as well. Yeah, so we I'm have sure. a format for everything. <laughs> yeah, so it's like, it's it's we're making it sound super nebulous, but there actually is a formula, you know, how that works or what that looks like, so. Yeah. That's very helpful. I've got to log off in a minute to go to another meeting. I want y'all to continue but I do want you, Chuck, to do one thing for us before I log off. I would love for you to share the two kingdoms gospel plan because um, I'm working through uh, four sets of gospel presentations. Mm -hmm. 
that I'm going to be presenting over and over and over and over. Um, and uh, the three circles is one of those, and the two kingdoms is one of those. So do you mind, let me put you on the spot and just okay. tell us how you would share the gospel using the two kingdoms. All because right. we're recording this meeting, and I can come back to this a hundred. Uh -huh. Yep. Thank you. Okay. So what I've come to realize is that there are two kingdoms, the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. Unfortunately, we're born into this kingdom, the kingdom of darkness. And the king of this kingdom, his name is Satan, and he's a liar. And he says, if you follow me, you can do whatever you want. But in the end, this king only gives death, darkness, and destruction. On the other hand, we have the kingdom of light. And Jesus is the king of this kingdom. And he came to earth and he died for all the selfishness that we have in this kingdom. All the things that we've done wrong. And then he rose from the dead. And now he says, if you will turn from your selfish ways and the kingdom of darkness and follow me as your king, come into the kingdom of light. I will give you life, love, and light for all eternity. So my question is, which king are you serving right now? That is well, two kings. That's so good. I love that. Thank you, Chuck. Um, I'm going to log off for the sake of... Um, Richard and Amber and Anthony, I want to ask you to do one more thing as I log off and go to a meeting. Um, I would love for you to do your one minute testimony. Um, we shared last week with the 15 second testimony uh, on our Wednesday night uh, doing the 411. Uh, but what I've encouraged folks is to think more in terms of the one minute testimony um, 15 seconds is great, but I like the way you do the one minute and it's always been a good model for me. And it's been kind of the model that I've used. So I'm going to log off and let you share that. In fact, I'm going to watch you do it until I get a note that the person I'm meeting with is actually here. So okay. do you mind doing that also? Would you mind if, uh, uh is, uh, Debbie Deb or does it? What? Yes. What? Yeah. That'd be awesome. Yeah. It's yeah, wonderful. So well, this is my favorite because it's the one I use. Great. Like of all, I mean, I'll do the two kingdoms if it, if they need more explanation, but I'll always, almost always start off because I never have a pencil and paper with me. I'm sorry, Mark. Not a, <laughs> not a three circles girl. Um, okay, so what I usually will say is, you know, uh, there was a time in my life where I was frustrated and super guilty because I was trying to do things right and I kept messing up. And uh, one day I was telling my friend about this and she said, hey, no whoops, because the, in the Bible it says that everybody's messed up. But she said, but you know what? God did something about that. God loves us so much that he sent his son Jesus down to the earth. Jesus lived a perfect life. And then he died willingly on a cross for every messed up thing that you've ever done. He was buried and then he rose again, proving that he's the king. And she said, if you ask him for forgiveness and make him your king, then you won't feel that guilt and that you know, frustration. So it, it made a lot of sense to me. I decided I need, to, I need to take action and do something. So I went home, I got on my knees, and I prayed and I asked God for forgiveness and um, made a determination I was gonna make Jesus my king from that point on. And it's like immediately I felt that forgiveness my friend talked about but also just this freedom, not having to be good on my own. So my question for you is, have you ever um, asked for forgiveness and made Jesus your king? That's so helpful. Thank you, Deb. Y'all press on, I'm checking out. Uh, thank you for your time and I wanna do a follow-up <laughs> meeting very soon. All right. All Great right. job, thank y'all. Uh, Richard, Amber, Anthony, y'all press on and uh, enjoy. Love you, Bart. Love you guys. Thank you for this time. We'll be right back together soon. All right.